everybody. Welcome to Sun City Church. We're so glad to see you this morning. Come on in. Find your seat. Let's get ready to worship Jesus. Let's give him our very, very best. Come on. He's worthy of our very best praise today. Let's give it to him. Let's have some fun while we're doing it. Come on. Sing it again. Sing his 
Church. We are so glad you came to join us today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Hey, my name is Chris, and I wanted to let you know just a couple things that will be happening in the next 70 minutes or so together. When I stop talking, we're going to sing a couple more songs, um, and then you're going to see a short video announcement letting you know some important information that's going on. And then it's your privilege. I got to hear first service. We have a guest speaker that's going to share with us in our series on Galatians. You're going to love Pastor Doug. It's going to be a ton of fun. Um, so as we go back into singing, uh, what we like to do here at Sun City Church is we turn the lights down just a little bit, we turn the music up just a little bit, and that's for you. Uh, we want this to be a time for you where you can feel comfortable to connect with God. You don't have to feel distracted by the person next to you or embarrassed if maybe you want to try lifting your hands. But the reason we do that is we know that God wants to connect with you this morning. And so we want you to have every opportunity you can to try to connect with God. You're just going to open up your heart, open up your spirit. No matter where you find yourself, if you're seeking, uh, if you're not sure if God is real, you are welcome here to discover and explore that. And so I would encourage you, as we go back into singing, open up your heart and allow God to speak to you and just show you how much He loves you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's jump right back in. love you so much this morning. God, we just lift up who you are. God, we're grateful for your presence. God, we're grateful for your love. God, that never leaves us, never runs away from us. God, we love you. God, we worship you together this morning. Great name. Your love so great, Jesus, in all things. Seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years. Still I'll be singing How can I praise you in the How can I praise you in the Come on church, let's lift them up You are the Lord Almighty I shine in all the stars Flip that up tonight.
to make. Sometimes it's good for us to come into church and confess some things, but I had one of those weeks, you know, where you just kind of get overwhelmed by the things coming at you. You feel like there's so much to do, but not enough time to do it. And I found myself just kind of complaining to God. Has that ever happened to any of you? Complaining, God, you know, why this and why that? And I was letting my emotions and my attitude get the best of me. And what's so great about God is he didn't he didn't do what I would have done. He didn't yell at me or get mad at me, but he listened, right? God is good like that. He listened to me. And what's so fun is we were teaching the kids uh, in our Sun City Kids in Summer Blast. The first uh, series, we taught them about how big God is. And so God was reminding me, remember what you were t- teaching all those kids? And so God's just like, I'm big. Like I am, I'm in charge of the universe. Like I'm spinning planets and solar systems and galaxies and they're staying in place just by my word. They're hanging there and, and everything's just fine. So like, I understand you feel a little bit stressed out, but like, think about me for a second. This is God in my conversation, but he was listening to me and, and being gracious with me. But then the second week, what was so fun in Sun City Kids is we talked about how much God loves us and how much God is pursuing us and wants to be near to us. And the scriptures say that like the psalmist is, is singing to God. And he's saying, when I consider the heavens and the works of your hands and the moon and the stars, like who am I that you even think about me? So God was reminding me of this. And it just, it made me just kind of hit pause and stop and just, just be thankful for God's love and how much he loves us and cares about us. That despite how big and amazing he is, right? He still cares about us and listens to us complain and then opens up his arms so he can love us. And so that's my prayer for us this morning. We're gonna go back and we're gonna sing this song again. Just, I, I would encourage you to get yourself to that place that you just you just realize, wow, God, you're, you're big. Like you created all of this. You've been around forever and you will be around forever. Like I'm here for just such a short time, but despite that, God, you listen to me, you care about me. You know the number of hairs on my head. Your, your thoughts towards me, God, are more numerous than the sand is on the seashore. So find, your, like, find that place today as we sing this song again. Realize like, that the God of the universe, the God who created everything, wants right now in this moment to meet with you, to draw close to you. And so we're going to sing and just, just express your love towards God. And as you do that, you will experience his overwhelming love coming into your life. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to do that. Amen? God, we love you so much. God, we are so excited. God, about the life that you've given us. God, we realize, God, inside of our sin, inside of our brokenness, God, we are, we're nothing. God, we have nothing. But God, you come and you breathe life into us. By your spirit, God, you make us alive. God, and you love us more than we will ever even understand. And so right now, God, as we sing, 
God, I pray that you would receive our love, but then pour out your love on us. God, we cannot function, we cannot live, we can't even breathe without your love. God, the hope of the world residing in us. So right now, God, as we lift up our voice, God, come and fill this place. God, come and fill the praises of your people with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Just right there, just sing that, just like that. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Come on, let's sing it out. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Everybody said amen. Amen, amen. Hey, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Would you do this? Would you look your neighbor in the eye, tell him you're so glad to see him today, and give him like the tallest high five that you can reach up to. If you're standing by a tall man, I am sorry. Just do your best. And let's check out our video announcement and see what's going on this week. Welcome to Sun City Church. The ushers handed you a worship guide on your way in today. If you're new to Sun City Church, there's some helpful information inside along with a connect card. The connect card is one of the ways to communicate with you and for us to know about any prayer requests we can be praying for in your life. You can also indicate if you're new and we'd love to connect with you and answer any questions that you might have. As a part of our ongoing support and partnership of local charities, and ministries will donate five dollars on your behalf for filling out a connect card for the first time look for an email this week about which local ministry you'd like us to donate to child dedication celebrations are where we set aside time to honor and pray for parents as they commit to raising their child to know jesus our next one is coming up the next sunday july 29th the celebration will take place after second service and you can invite friends and family to join for it Sign up today online at suncitychurch.com or through the Sun City app. Our monthly team night is tonight from 6 to 7.30 p.m. and Pastor Doug Sherman will be speaking at it. We're going to have a ton of fun, so don't miss it. If you haven't joined a team yet, our Next Steps class will help you do that. Next Steps is the place to learn more about Sun City Church and how to get involved. The first class in the series is now available after second service every Sunday. Join us for it today free lunch and childcare are provided. Thank you so much for being here with us today. You can learn more about any of these announcements through the app or at suncitychurch.com. Have a great week. Well, hey everyone. I am so glad you made it to church today. This weekend, Jamie and I are down in Austin, Texas, ministering at a dynamic new church called Planet Shakers Austin, which is pastored by our dear friends, Poncho and Laura Lauder. Today, you get the special privilege of hearing from a great pastor and leader who has served our region faithfully for years. 
Pastor Doug Sherman is the lead pastor at Grace Harvest Church in Moses Lake, Washington. He and his wife Peggy have built a thriving church that has helped hundreds of people find new life in Christ and make a big difference in their community. Pastor Doug is going to be continuing the series on the book of Galatians, and I know you're going to love it. Come on, Sun City Church. Let's stand to our feet and let's show our love for Pastor Doug Sherman. Good morning. Nice to be here. Greetings. Go ahead and be seated. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Greetings from Moses Lake, Washington. We're just kind of down the road a bit, you know. Um, good to be here. Um, Doug and Peggy Sherman, we have been married going on 31 years in a couple weeks. It'll be 31 years. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Happened we have, quick. Yeah, we have four uh, adult children, um, a son, a daughter, and two other sons. And the first three are married. Um, it's great. We have a granddaughter. Love it. Awesome. Want more? Yeah. So, but I just, I just pray. You more, know, Lord. Just more. wait. <laughs> so it's so good to be here. Um, he's my favorite preacher, teacher. So you're in for a treat today. So thank you for inviting us and letting us be here. Amen. Thank you, hon. Yep. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me, and I know that um, we're supposed to say things like that, but I genuinely mean it. My life has been so enriched, and I've learned more about the love of God, more about the grace of God, more about how many of you guys can relate to this, the forgiveness of God through my wife than any other person on earth. I've seen Jesus manifested through my wife in so many amazing ways over the years, and it's a privilege to be with you today. You have a great church, loved the first service, and I'm excited to speak here today and be with you and have the opportunity to share God's heart with you. And, um, and I just want to tell you, you really do things well. I've been stalking Sun City Church uh, since you started. I just want you to know that. I'm a Facebook stalker, unashamed, and uh, been Facebook stalking you since the church first planted even before that. I remember when Danny and Jamie were first beginning to go through the process of getting ready to plant a church, and uh, what an amazing church what a great group of people. You're doing it well. You're serving well. You're making a huge impact in your city, and I just want to salute you in the name of the Lord. Will you pray with me before we get into the Word, and then we'll get right into it. Father, thank you for the beautiful people in this room. I want to echo what the psalmist said. How lovely are your dwelling places, O oh God. Thank you for your people. Thank you that you, Holy Spirit, are present with us and that you're the illuminator and the teacher. I pray that you would teach us today, that you would illuminate the Scripture to us and bring it alive I pray, Lord, that you would be with my mouth and mind, and you would enable me to be bold, to be clear, and to be accurate. I pray the rest of us here would be able to hear the word, apply it to our lives, that, Lord, you would help us to get it down inside, and then walk it out with our feet in our day-to-day -day living. Thank you for it. We, we welcome you. We welcome your presence here, Holy Spirit. Thank you, helper. Thank you, paraclete. Now, come alongside and do what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I have to take one more drink of water here. Uh, I seem to uh, have preacher's mouth. Anybody, any of you ever have preacher's mouth? It's this thing that happens when you talk too much. Your mouth gets dry. So we're continuing the series on Galatians chapter 5, and I want to start with some cute little um, uh, insights from children on what love is. And this uh, is in response to the question, what is love? And one child says, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time. I know, right? Even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. How about this one? When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. Isn't that true? You know that your name is safe in their mouth. Ouch, right? Love is when someone hurts you and you get so mad, but you don't yell at them because you know it would hurt their feelings. Or love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure the taste is okay. Aw, these are awesome. I love these. How about this? Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. These kids are profound. Somebody needs to get the children preaching in our churches, right? Come on. This is amazing. Love is like that little old woman and little old man who are still friends, 
even after they know each other so well. <laughs> Amen. Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Brad Pitt. <laughs> Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him home alone all day. Aww. And the last one, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People forget. <laughs> wow. Today, I want to show you the love letter of Paul to the Galatians. And I want to talk to you about real grace and about real freedom. And here's my message today. I got, I got a fighting message. Any of you like fighting? If you do, we'll talk about it afterward. Any MMA fans or boxing fans? But anyway, today I want to talk to you about the fact that you must fight for your freedom in the Spirit's power. So you can't do it on your own, but you have to fight for your freedom in the Spirit's power. That's what Galatians chapter 5 shows us. So my first point is simply this, fight to keep your freedom. Fight to keep your freedom. Galatians chapter 5 verses 1 and 4 says this, so Christ has truly set us free. Can anybody say amen to that one? Now make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Verse 4. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, listen carefully to this next point. Wow, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. Now I just want to point out some things that go along with this text. And first of all, Galatians was written to people who were in jeopardy of losing their freedom in Jesus. And did you know that all of us in this room, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian or a follower of Jesus or whatever is the cool term today, whatever term you use to describe your relationship with God, do you know that every day along your journey you are in jeopardy of losing your freedom in Christ? Fallen human nature loves to earn or work for approval. The sinful nature has always tried to cover sin and pay for it with sacrifices and rule keeping. We have to fight for our freedom by trusting completely in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Fighting for our freedom is part of what we have to do on a regular basis because it's our fallen sinful nature's tendency to try to earn our way back into God's good graces. Right? Think about Adam and Eve. Right from the beginning, in the fall, what did they do? They fell at a tree. A tree offered life. A tree offered death. And when they fell and they sinned, they immediately went and hid. Where? Among the trees of the garden. And they covered themselves in fig leaves. And they instituted the first man-made religion. First fig tree church. Right down the street. Right? And they instituted the tendency within human beings to immediately, when we have sinned against God, to find ways to self-justify and to find ways to cover. First we hide, then we cover. Right? And, and what does God do? God comes along in the garden and the first thing He does is slays an animal and clothes them in skins, and demonstrates to them what happens with sin. Sin leads to death. Death leads to a sacrifice. I have to provide the sacrifice, and now you're covered, and you wear with you the evidence that someone else is covering what you did, or something else in this case, a type and a shadow of the one who was to come. And Galatians was written to people who were reverting back to trying to gain God's favor by keeping the law of Moses. Again, sinful nature easily reverts to trying to work for approval from God by keeping all the rules and living right within its own power. We like to be able to boast. We like to be able to say, I'm good. My own journey as a follower of Jesus has been one of constantly returning to the grace found at the foot of the cross. Because, you know, I'm one that grew up first of seven children scattered over three different mothers and a lot of brokenness and separation. My mom was uh, 14 years old when she got pregnant with me. My dad was a drug addict and a convict. I was separated from him at five years old, reunited at 19, and he'd become a 
wild preacher and prophet, and we were brought back together. And all the time I was growing up, my stepfather raised me, and he was very exacting, very strict, and it never seemed like I could please him. And I, I grew up in this home where I was always working hard. I was the oldest, trying, struggling to be the best, get the best grades, be you know, live right. And, and then I got into drugs, and I got into all kinds of things as a teenager, and my, my heart was self-condemned. And, I, and then I came to Jesus, and grace rocked me. Grace rocked wrecked me. Grace ruined me in a good kind of way. I had never experienced such amazing love. To be loved, to be favored, to have heaven smile on me in spite of me, in spite of all the shameful acts I had committed, the shameful things I thought, in spite of all that, God was saying, I love you because of my son. I am giving all of my son's rightness to you. All of my son's love is is in you. I'm putting that in you. And now when you stand before me you stand before me as though you are Jesus and that ruined me but within a short time I had begun because you know you struggle you fall you sin you have those besetting sins in your life you you slip into them over and over again and you begin to believe in the back of your mind I got to do something to pay for this you might not even do it consciously it might be subconscious but in the back of your mind you think okay I need to feel bad for a certain length of time I need to make sure that I, I really up the fasting and the prayer and the Bible reading and, and all of those things are good, but if you're doing them, if you've come up with your own law code of what will ultimately please God and bring you back into his good graces, you are missing the gospel. The gospel says, he did it all. It is finished. Right? That's the gospel. Not I do the work. I fulfill the rules. Can you tell I'm getting excited about this? When we try to gain God's approval by keeping the rules and good works, we cut ourselves off, this is profound, from Christ, and we fall from grace. He said that right in the text. This doesn't mean we lose our salvation necessarily, but that we are cut off from the life-giving power of Christ and His grace. We become powerless to change and to live the Christian life. Right? If we continue to live by the law, we could ultimately jeopardize our, eter- our eternity. Paul is issuing a, war- a warning. Don't trust yourself, your rule keeping, or your own good works to make you right with God. Trust Jesus alone. Right? So he's saying, look, when you slip out of grace and you begin to think that your own good works and your own efforts make you right with God, What immediately happens is you get cut off and severed from the life-giving power within to overcome sin, right? So I don't know about you, but I need power within to overcome sin. I desperately do. I can't beat it on my own, right? And neither can you. I can't keep all the commandments and do everything just right. So Jesus did it on my behalf. And then he put his spirit within you and I, and that spirit empowers us, and, and that's grace, Grace is that inward ability, not just being favored by God. Grace is also the divine empowerment and enablement within to overcome sin. Are you following me? So so what happens is when I begin to quit trusting the spirit within and the grace of God and the work of Christ alone, and I start trusting my ability to keep the rules, I immediately am severed from the life-giving influence of God within to resist And that's when Darth Vader says, resistance is futile. Okay, that takes me to the second point. Fight against legalism by faith expressed in love. Now, here's one of the ways we fight. We fight by faith expressed in love. Look at verses 6 through 9. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. Let me just stop there real quick. We're gonna, Paul's focusing on circumcision because a group was coming into the church and telling them they had to be circumcised if they were going to be right. I know for a lot of the ladies out here, you're going, that's weird. And even the dudes are going, that's weird, right? But it was under the law code of Moses, circumcision was showed that they were the covenant people of God. And now there were these Gentiles, these non-Jews who were coming to faith in Jesus, and these false teachers came into the church and they said, look, you got to be circumcised. It's another way of saying you have to keep certain rules and do certain things to be on the inside. If you want to be a part of the chosen group, you've got to do these things. Paul writes him and says, listen, if you're going to keep circumcision, you've got to keep all the law, and you know that's impossible. Right? So he's saying, that doesn't benefit you. What is important, notice this, is faith expressing itself 
in love. You were running the race so well, who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for He is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. He says, don't let this false teaching that you got to keep these rules or be a part of this inner circle or you got to do it the way they used to do it. There's even a movement today in many churches and in many places that say if you really want to be on the inside with God, you got to go back to the Jewish way of doing everything. And Paul categorically shows that that's false teaching because what it does is it provides another way to God other than the cross and the finished work of Jesus. And he's saying, stop it. That little bit of yeast messes up the whole thing. If you make that a requirement, listen, if you do those things because you have your own conviction and you like them and you love them and you want to, great, when you start making it something that everybody else has to do, if they're going to be on the inside circle, the inner ring of what God's doing, that's when you get into error. Are you following me? So out of this, what do we see? Following the Jewish laws and customs or any other law code or customs will never make us right with God. There's nothing that we can do or say that will make us any more loved or any more right with God than simply believing in what he did in his son. That's too simple, isn't it? Jesus did it all. He was your substitute. He hung for you. He took your sin. He took your death. He took your judgment. He rose from the dead. He conquered sin, death, and hell. He did it all for you. Why are you trying to do it? That's what he's saying, right? See, rule-keeping... Self-punishment or good works will never add anything. And in fact, they are considered an assault against the cross. An assault. Whenever we try to add anything to what Christ has done, we are assaulting the essence of the gospel. And we're saying, sorry, Jesus, thank you for what you did. You hung there, it was great. Thank you for all of your suffering. Thank you for the cat of nine tails, the ripped beard, the crown of thorns in your head, for the spitting and the beatings, everything you went through. Thank you for the crucifixion. But I just want you to know, it's not quite enough. I just want you to know, I'm going to add my own self-righteousness to it. I know it's silly, isn't it, when you think of it that way? See, religion, man-made religion, always has its own rules. It reminds me of this funny little story that was in Today in the Word by MBI. It says... uh, The story was told some years ago of a pastor who found the roads blocked one Sunday morning and was forced to skate on the river to go to church. And so he did. When he arrived, the elders of the church were horrified that their pastor had skated on the Lord's Day. After the service, they held a special meeting where the pastor explained that it was either he had to skate to church or not be there at all. Finally, one of the elders asked him, did you enjoy it? And the pastor responded quickly, no. And the board said, okay, then it's all right. You see, and that's what man-made religion does. Listen, if it's not the law of Moses, it'll be another set of laws, another set of rules. Have you ever noticed that cults or cult-type groups always have certain things, certain requirements, hoops you have to jump through if you really want to be right? And let me just give you a little bit of a warning in the time that we live. Whenever any group begins to say that it's exclusive, that it's tapped into something very unique, that it's finally got the real gospel, and that, that key that was missing has finally come, whenever anyone or or any group, any teacher starts to say that, you know you are on your way to error. Right? The gospel is powerful, and Jesus is the message. He's our hero. He's our teacher. He's our prophet and our guide. Right? Alone. Thank you, Jesus. Faith alone in Jesus and his work makes and keeps us right with God. I've already said that multiple times. Faith expresses itself in love toward God and neighbor. Faith finds expression and takes acts, action, excuse me, in loving acts toward God and our neighbors. Good works are the natural outflow of a heart of faith and love. When we love God and our neighbor, we must take action. And this is important, and it's going to segue right into my next point, which is faith, excuse me, fight against sin by loving and serving others. Now, let me just pause here and make a point. The Bible doesn't say that good works are unnecessary. The Bible says good works are unnecessary for right standing with God. But the Bible indicates that good works become a natural outflow of a life that is right with God. So when you've experienced grace, come on, you know what I'm talking about. 
If you've experienced, really experienced the grace of God in Jesus Christ and the love of God in Jesus Christ, something happens to you. You're altered within. You're changed within. I remember when I first came to Jesus, I was, I was so amazed that somebody could love me like God loved me. I remember the first time I began to really be aware that I was hearing his voice. The privilege I felt that God would talk to me. Right? And so I'm going along in this journey with God and I can't help but tell people about him. I can't help when I see people broken down on the side of the road to you know, pull over and help them. It can't help to have, but have a, a serve day or a serve week, right? It's the natural outflow. What you do in your community is the natural outflow of changed hearts. It's not us saying, you know, I want to be cool and known in that church. I want Pastor Danny and Jamie to recognize us. I want to be a part of the inner circle, part of the inner group. It's, none of those things are our motivating factor, right? The motivating factor is, I've been loved, I've been changed, I've been touched by the grace of God, and because of that, I am going to let other people know how good He is just by serving them. Right. Amen. So the third point, fight against sin by loving and serving others. Galatians 5, 13 through 15 says this, For if you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, excuse me, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't Use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. And then this companion text in 1 Corinthians 9, I want you to notice what Paul says here. He says, for though I am free from all, what an opening statement, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those inside, outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. Have you ever done that? To the weak, become weak? See, we think to the weak, we need to be strong. Paul says, to the weak, I became weak. Wow, that's, that's profound. I have become all things to all people that by, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. What, what's he saying? First of all, freedom in Jesus is not an excuse to follow our sinful nature and passions. Now look, throughout the history of the church, we have this, this strange tension that's existed. A truth in tension. And that is that right here, Right down the center, the road leading right to Jesus is the road of liberty and freedom. But over here we have a ditch. And this ditch is the road, or excuse me, the ditch of legalism. Me, my own efforts, following rules, coming up with whatever means I need to to get to God, that's the ditch of legalism. And over here is the ditch of what's known as license or licentiousness. And license and licentiousness is, I'm free, so now I have the license to do whatever I want to. God knows, God understands, I'm already forgiven. Jesus has already forgiven me of all the sin I'll ever commit, so I'm going to sin that grace may abound. And both of these extremes are wrong. Legalism is a ditch, licentiousness is a ditch, liberty in Christ, that's what we want. And Paul's saying, you can be free in Jesus Christ, but freedom doesn't give you the permission to do whatever you want to do. Freedom gives you the opportunity to serve. Whoa. Now, doesn't that seem like a strange, think about it. It seems like a paradox, right? Because the kind of freedom that leads into the ditch is slavery, you ever seen people there? yeah, I'm free in Jesus, man, so I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And before you know it, they're back to being addicted to that substance. But they're back to being addicted to that screen. They're back to being addicted to those unhealthy relationships or that unhealthy sexuality. Whatever it may be, they used to be somewhere else and they called it freedom. And when they went too far with their freedom into licentiousness, they were bound. See, that's not what he's saying to us. He's saying that freedom finds its truest expression in serving others in love. This seems like a paradox. How can freedom lead to service? In God's kingdom, service is chosen because we love as Jesus loved. Service to others is liberating and satisfying. Service is joy-giving. True freedom is service to others. 
Have you ever noticed yourselves, even maybe those of you who were a part of the serve, was it serve day? Yeah. Serve day, I want to say serve week, serve month, no, serve day, right? And, and by the way, you do understand, and I know you do understand this, that serve day is great, but it's, it's to show us a, a lifestyle. Yeah. It's to demonstrate for us the way we live every day, right? right? So when you did serve day, did you notice that as you did this, it, walking with other brothers and sisters and doing the work of them, you're laughing, you're enjoying, there's conversations, maybe there are even tensions and you work through it and then you're serving people and you're going through the city and people are honking their horns and by the end of the day, maybe you're sweaty, maybe you're hot, you worked hard, you're tired, but there's this deep sense of satisfaction. There's this deep sense of joy. Why? Because free people serve willingly and love it. I'll say that again. Free people serve willingly and love it. Amen. All right. So shall we continue? And freedom finds its truest expression in the willingness to do whatever it takes to bring people to faith in Jesus. Isn't that true? Paul makes it clear that he was willing to do whatever it took to declare the good news about Jesus. He adapted his life to find the common ground necessary to be able to relate to and win people to Jesus. Paul said, I'll be weak if I need to be weak. I'll be as a Jew if I need to be as a Jew. I'll be as a Gentile if I need to be as a Gentile. And you name your particular subculture, whatever it was. I'll tell you what, if Paul lived today and he was hanging out in Spokane and he was trying to reach a certain subculture, you know, if he was trying to reach the skater community, he, he, would, he would look silly, but he would go be among the skaters and wear skater clothes, right? Some of you are like, what are you talking about? It's true. This Jewish old man would be down there skating, <laughs> falling on his butt, and then saying, hey, let me tell you something. Let me tell you about somebody I know. And that takes me to the last point. We fight against sin by letting the Holy Spirit guide us. And you could say guide, fill, overflow, give fruit, empower. And I have a long text of Scripture, but I feel it's really important to read the whole text here. So read along with me if you would. i got to take a drink first. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guard, excuse me, guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. See the answer? The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, now I want you to notice he stops there. He says you're not free to carry out your good intentions, but now he shows us the answer. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Somebody say, wow. wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Yeah. So notice what he's saying here. He's saying that the battle between the sinful nature and and the spirit within us is a reality for the rest of our lives here. Why is that important? It's important that we understand that our lives will always have this conflict as long as we live on this side of eternity. However, if we trust in Jesus and let the spirit lead us, we won't follow the sinful nature. Now, why is this important? Because I've had people over the years come to me and they've just fallen on their face after a period of doing well and they'll say something like, I thought I was over that. I thought I was beyond that. I can't believe I did that. And here's my answer to that. That craving, that desire doesn't just go away, right? Right? I heard somebody, you know, recently say that, or I, who said this? Anyway, I don't know who said it, but, but you know, you can't cast out the carnal nature, right? right? And you can't disciple the devil, right? You can't renew his mind. You just can't do it. And in, in the case of, 
our carnal, the sinful nature, there's going to be this struggle within, within the body, which is still corrupting, within the mind and its old memories. There is still a battle for self-will, the assertion that I'm the Lord, I'm God, you're not. That battle still rages in us. And, and sin is an interesting thing because when you first begin to walk with Jesus, you know, it's like an onion. And the more you cut it, the more layers it has and the more it makes you cry. Right, and it starts out with some people, they have this onion of sin, you know, in their life, this sinful nature, and they cut the outside, and they peel it off, and they're like, man, cool, I quit smoking, drinking, chewing, and running with the girls that doing, you know, I quit doing all that stuff, I'm not, I'm not doing the bad stuff anymore, and they think, ah, I'm beating sin, and then they cut another layer, and they find out, wow, there's some gossip in there, and there's some lying, and there's some judgmentalism, and some self-righteousness, and I'm looking at other people like I'm superior to them, and I'm looking down on this person, and so what happens throughout the Christian life is you're aware that there is this sinful nature, and it's there, it is a conflict, and you're going to deal with that conflict for life, but if we follow the Spirit, we have power to overcome, Amen? Sometimes you just need a big butt right in the middle of that kind of stuff, right? Number two, sorry, probably just offended somebody. Secondly, the, the spirit within <laughs> is far more powerful than the sinful nature, and you are destined to conquer with his help. See, Paul's not speaking of the sinful nature and the indwelling spirit as if they are on equal terms. He's not saying that. He's saying there is a battle, but he's not saying they're on equal terms. It's not like, you know, the yin and the yang, and we're trying to find balance in the force, and there's the darkness and the light, Luke, and, you know, I am your father. None of that, okay? There is, there's not this equal tension. There is the powerful Holy Spirit inside of you and the tension of the sinful nature trying to do its own thing, but the power within you is far, far greater. Now say, say this with me. The spirit within, the spirit within. conquers sin. So you can win. win. Come on. And then the next point, when we follow the Holy Spirit's leading, good fruit is produced and the sinful nature is overcome. The works of the sinful nature are overcome when we let the fruit that is growing within us burst out in our lives. I remember years ago, you all remember, it's still going on, but the campaign, just say no to drugs, right? Just say no. And I, I found that it was inadequate, and it was, it's, it's like a law, it's like a rule, just say no to drugs. You really think that's going to stop people from doing drugs, right? I mean, I, it hasn't worked in my life, just saying no has never worked. No, no, yes, <laughs> right? But you have to say yes to something else, right? There has to be a displacement. The sinful nature must be displaced by something more powerful. And what displaces the sinful nature is the power of the Spirit growing inside of us, producing fruit, love, joy, peace, so on and so on, right? So that's how we overcome sin in our life, is by letting the Spirit within displace sin with His power. And I'm I'm telling you, you are destined to overcome. You've been created to overcome. Though it's a battle, and we must learn to fight it. We have the fruit of God himself growing within us, and God can never be overcome by sin. See, we have to really believe what the Scripture says, that God indwells us by his Spirit. And this is why it's so important we learn that relationship. We learn to yield to his promptings and be led by him and learn his voice and learn his presence and learn the daily dictates of walking in the unforced rhythms of grace. If we learn that and walk with him, then we'll know and we'll face a temptation, we'll face a struggle, we'll face that sin staring us in the eyes, staring us down and saying, I got you this time and saying, no, because the spirit within me is empowering me and peace is going to overcome fear and strife. And love is going to overcome hate. Right? So we have that power within. Which takes me back to the main point, the big idea today. And here it was. You must fight for your freedom in the Spirit's power. You can't fight for your freedom in your own power. Your rules won't do it. Right? I mean, it's it's good to have some things in our lives, but without the Spirit's power, you can't do it. You think about relationships. I don't know why I'm going here, but I'm going to go here. Maybe, you know, you're younger. You don't even have to be younger, but you're younger and you're in a relationship with somebody. And you have a lot of chemistry and there's a lot of attraction. 
and you're really moving toward each other and you, you, you feel like, oh man, this is getting more and more difficult all the time, right? And you, you want to do things that you know you shouldn't do. And so what do you do? You know, you sit down and you come up with some rules. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're not going to go here. We're not going to go there. We're not going to be alone here. And all those things are great, but I'm telling you, if you're counting on your rule and your law code, you're never going to be able to overcome So you got to have the power of the Spirit within, even to enable you to come up with the right kind of boundaries in your life. People say all the time, you got to have boundaries. Let me tell you what, boundaries are powerless without the power of the Holy Spirit enabling you to keep them. I'm talking to somebody right now. Amen. You're loved. You know, I can't depart from this because I want to make sure we don't end on the idea that it's about just the struggle against sin. I want you to know you have grace in Jesus Christ. You're forgiven, you're loved, you're part of the family, you're a son, you're a daughter. You learned that last week from Jamie, right? You're a son, you're a daughter of God, you have right standing with God, and it's all because of Jesus Christ. And you can't add one iota to the finished work of the cross. But let me remind you, you also have power within you. And that power is enabling you to live in a way you could never live on your own. Because the Christian life is impossible lived in the the strength of man or woman. It's impossible. It's an impossible call that can't be done without the empowering presence of God within. And that's the beauty of the gospel. We all have that power within. Amen? You know, I want to pray for some people. And I I just want to share some thoughts here with you. You know, the first battle that all of us face in our lives is for our very soul to be liberated from sin and death. You can call it salvation, being born again, being forgiven, becoming a child of God. There are a number of terms in the New Testament, but the bottom line is this. Every human soul apart from Jesus Christ is bound by the power of sin. And the inevitable consequence of that is eternal death. Whatever eternal death looks like, that is, that is the ultimate consequence, separation. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to give us freedom by dying on the cross for our sin and being in our place. He died in our place to make us right with God, to present his own rightness to the Father on our behalf so we could stand before the Father and the Father could say of us, you are right because of my son. Amen. You're right. You're good. We're good. It's family. Come on in. Today, he wants to bring you freedom. Today, you can receive him and you can begin a new life. You can pray a simple prayer That can be part of your journey toward him. And you can say, forgive me. Come into my life. Change me. Give me power to live the right way. Lord, I want my conscience cleansed. I'm tired of the shame. I'm tired of the guilt. I'm tired of the self-effort and the failings over and over again. I want to live for you. You may be here and you've already done that at some point in your life. But you say, you know, I've wandered off. All we like sheep have gone astray and I've gone astray and I'm out there doing stuff I know I shouldn't be. I'm living a secret life and I'm hiding it from people and most of all, I'm trying to hide it from God. Guess what? He can't be hidden from. The eyes of the Lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil of the, and the good. Right? He knows us and he loves us. He doesn't want us to stay there. We, we sung about him today, sang, sung about him. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, it's chasing you down. It's fighting till you're found, right? It leaves the 99. It's, he's coming after you. So you might be here and be out there a little bit. And I want to tell you right now, you can make your way back home. You can come back to the Father's house and you can find love and an embrace and forgiveness of sin in a fresh way. Does this make sense? I want to encourage you. Make your way back to him. He wants to give you a fruitful life full of his love and grace. He wants to free you to serve and to love others. He wants you to come to him today. And that can happen in a simple prayer. So what I want to do is I want to, in just a moment, ask you to bow your heads and I want to pray with you to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. To invite Him to come into your life and begin a journey with Him. It's just the beginning. It's not the end, right? It's not just a ticket to heaven. That's not what we're trying to gain here is a ticket to heaven. We're gaining right relationship with God and the kingdom of heaven coming to dwell inside of human beings. That's why Jesus came, to invade the earth with the kingdom of heaven. And he wants to invade your life. He wants to move in and take ground inside of you. And, and, and so I'm going to ask you to pray with me in a minute. And, and I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and, and just let me know. I'm, I'm going to ask you to communicate with me in a moment that you want to start a journey or you want to come back to him today. So will you close your eyes with me for just a moment? I, I want to pray and, and just say, Father, I, I pray right now your spirit would take this message, take the power of the scripture. 
Take the power of the preached word and let it find its mark in every human heart in here. And let every person, every man, every woman, every child, every young person in here turn to you. And Lord, if there's any that don't know you or any that may need to make their way back to you, I pray that right now they would do that and not let anything stand in the way. So with your head bowed, I just want to ask you, do you need him today? And are you willing to say, I need him, or I'm ready to come back to him? If that's you, if you're ready to start following Jesus today, and you'll pray with me, or you're ready to return to him today, would you just let your hand go up and let me see your hand all over the room? Just let me see your hands. If you want to follow Jesus Christ today, I see your hands. I see Anyone else? You're here. You say, I want to. I see your hand. Anyone else? You, you want to follow the Lord. I see your hands back there. Thank you. Anyone else? Good, good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You say, today I want to follow him. I want to come to him. I want to turn to him. I want to know him. And let me tell you, it's the greatest adventure you'll ever embark on in your life. Okay, let's pray this together, church. And I know you do this every week, so you know what to do. Will you pray with me? And those of you that raised your hands, just say something like this to God. Say it with me or say something from your own thoughts, your own heart to God. But say this to me. Jesus, I need you. And I recognize that my sins need to be atoned for and a way needs to be made for me to have a relationship with you and with Father God so Jesus I embrace you I believe you died on the cross and I believe you rose again bodily I know your death on the cross cleansed my sin and makes me right with my Father so come into my life Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Captivate my heart and give me power from within to live the way you want me to. Change my life now. I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, can we celebrate right now? We had a number of people raise their hands. Let's give praise to God. Welcome to the family. So great, so fun. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Such a good word. I know I was challenged. Uh, it's not just a matter of saying no, but we got to say yes, right, to something. Saying yes to the Spirit's power in our life to overcome sin. So good. Hey, on your way in, uh, the ushers tried to hand you a worship guide. Inside of that was an, a connection card. If you got one of those and you're new with us and you have questions about our church, um, go ahead and fill this out. Uh, there's some questions you can check on the back of there. Uh, and drop it in the offering bucket when it comes by, or you can leave it in the Welcome Center on your way out. It's just our way of communicating with you and helping you uh, discover whatever ever it is you're looking for. Um, also at the bottom, too, my favorite part, there's a place to put a prayer request. If there's something you're dealing with or going through, we want to pray with you about it. There's a team of our church that prays through those every single week. Uh, we would love to join with you and pray that way. Hey, right after this, after second service, across the lobby in our Next Steps room, we're having our Next Steps class. That's a class for you if you're brand new or if you've been coming for a while and you're trying to figure out what is Sun City Church all about? What do they believe? Why do they do what they do? Why do they look so happy up there on stage and jumping around? Come to Next Steps and find out. Uh, we'll tell, tell you anything you want to know. I'd love to meet you there uh, right after this. There's lunch and child care provided, so I'd invite you to that. At uh, this time, ushers, if you want to come forward, we're going to get ready to receive our tithes and our offerings. Something we've been doing here at church now for a little while is uh, our video team has been putting together some videos to show us how your generosity is impacting our community and impacting our church. And so uh, we have another one of those great videos this week. Um, so as we get ready to give, let's watch this video together. We are here at summer camp with our junior high and high school students, and they have been having a blast. This is maybe one of the most incredible campgrounds that we've ever been to with lots of fun things for them to do. They're playing on the water, they're doing paintball, they're zip lining, they're doing all kinds of crazy fun stuff. They're also building some great friendships, interacting with their leaders, and most importantly, they're connecting with God in really powerful ways. In fact, right now at this very moment, Pastor Matt Moll is speaking to them all about the call of God on their life. And it's something we're so passionate about at Sun City Church, that every single one of these young people, they are called by God to make a difference. So we're so thankful for your generosity that enables us to be a part of things like this summer camp. 
Thank you for contributing, for being a part of this with us, for everyone who has prayed. These young people are gonna do incredible things and there's so much that we're thankful for that you have contributed to that process. So today you can give in the 